Hi, thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Jesse Peterson. I'm the Director of Education here at Sunray Construction Solutions. Sunray secures $10 billion annually for GC's subs and suppliers. We are a national construction document service. Today's webinar is conducted by the incredible Shannon Bell, a Colorado construction lean law expert. Today's webinar topic is a contractor, subcontractors, and suppliers step-by-step -step guide to getting paid. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the fabulous Shannon Bell. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and thanks to all of you who are listening in today. Uh, we have a lot of material. I'm gonna try to cover this and, and give you some highlights as to some ideas and protections to help you get paid. Uh, but as we go through the presentation today, if you have any questions, please go ahead and use that GoToWebinar chat box on the right. We will have time at the end of the presentation and we'll get to those questions and answer those at the end. One thing that we do ask is please do not share specific names or company names in the questions. I uh, just want to keep that part of it anonymous. So I'll uh, giving you just a quick roadmap of what you can expect uh, from our presentation today. Uh, we're going to talk about one change, just one change in your contract. Uh, I love contracts. I'm a lawyer. You all may uh, not like them, but they are. Uh, there's we, we could spend hours talking about your contract, but I'm just going to talk about one change on that you should have in your contract: securing your lien rights, securing your bond rights, some exceptions to liens that you should be aware of, kind of the off overlooked issue of the notice to disperser. Another uh, arrow you can uh, put in your quiver there to try to help get you paid and looking at ways to exchange a release for a check. A couple of different, uh, different, depending on whether you are in the progress payment or final payment, we're gonna talk about that and wanna make sure that we share with you some of the really wonderful resources that are available to you uh, by Sunrise. So please uh, make sure to stay tuned all the way through to the end to get those. So contract protections, like I said, uh, we can talk about this forever. One thing I would suggest that you add if you don't have it, and oh, by the way, have a contract. Uh, there's so many of my clients that come to me, especially in this industry. Uh, you've known each other for years. It's This is a, an industry that really grew up on a handshake. That's no longer the issue. Uh, Colorado in particular, the last several years, construction has just exploded. Uh, there's lots of newcomers to the state. So first and foremost, get a written contract. Second, one thing I would add, add a prevailing party clause. Well, what is this? Why do you want this? In Colorado, uh, and most of the states, quite frankly, in the country, in the event of a dispute over a contract, you do not automatically have the right to obtain your attorney's fees if you win. And what a, unless it is in a contract. So you can either obtain attorney's fees if you're suing under a statute that provides for the recovery of attorney's fees or if it is put in your contract. I'm not going to read to you, but I've put in the materials for you a sample prevailing party clause. Then this is going to help protect you. This is a presentation on getting paid. So if you are listening to this presentation, you're looking for ways uh, to get paid, you're already being harmed by doing the work and not getting paid for that work. You don't want to get a double whammy on that by having to pursue legal action and then being out the legal fees and not being able to recover them. So that prevailing party clause is going to help you mitigating that harm from having to pursue a legal action by putting in an opportunity to also recover your legal fees. So very important please consider putting that in your contracts if it's not already there. Uh, so now let's, let's move on to securing your lien rights. Uh, hopefully most of you have already heard about liens, you know what a lien is. Uh, there's uh, lots of nuances to a lien. So one of the most important things to know about mechanics liens in the state of Colorado, and again, uh, this is this uh, presentation today, we are focused on Colorado, but a lot of this information is similar, well, with slight variations from most of the states across the country. But for Colorado, um, these are a mechanics lien is a right, it's a remedy created by statute. And what a lien is going to do is it allows you, if you haven't gotten paid for as a construction professional, 
for improvements to real property, it allows you to go and encumber that property. That's a pretty big deal uh, to be able to go and uh, put a lien to encumber somebody's personal real property. So because of that, because of that impact on the homeowner, on the landowner, the statute is strictly construed, which means if you want to record a lien, you want to try to protect your right to get paid through the mechanics lien, it really has to be perfect. The number one part of this is that it has to be timely. What does that mean? Well, in order to timely perfect the lien rights, you must record the lien. And that means going down to the clerk and recorder in the county where the work was performed and physically handing it to the clerk and recorder or a lot of um, here now, a lot of our clerk and recorders allow online recordation. Uh, so you can do it online as well. But you must record it within four months of the last date that material or labor was furnished. Uh, note, if you're doing material, uh, ma la pardon me, material's a little bit easier. You go, you deliver the lumber. Uh, that, that's a pretty easy date to calculate. Last day labor was furnished. That is generally going to be the substantial work to complete the contract or the scope of the work, even if you don't have a written contract. It is not going to include things such as punch list or cleanup. That's not going to extend that date. But when were you basically done for all intents and purposes for the scope of work upon which you were hired? That's going to be the beginning of calculating that four months. It is four months by statute. It is not 100 and day, pardon me, 120 days. It is four months. Here's the other issue, very critical. You have to serve, so we're looking at two stages, a notice of intent to lien and then the actual recordation of the lien. Well, our statutes here say you can't just go record a lien. You have to give the people that owe you money or the people whose property you're about ready to try to encumber, you got to give them an opportunity to pay you first. And the way you do that under the mechanics lien statute is you got to send them that notice of intent to lien. And that has to be sent. Uh, you have to serve it by certified mail or registered mail return receipt or personal service at least. 10 days before the four month deadline. And assuming you do that, you do the notice 10 days before, uh, you record it four months within the last date of your work, then you still have to file a lawsuit. All of that paperwork's not gonna do anything. You gotta file that lawsuit within six months of the last date of work. So these deadlines are really important. And it's really important that you have somebody in your organization or if you work with an attorney uh, that you're keeping everyone informed and watching those deadlines. I would, uh, almost, I would almost guarantee that at least one or two folks listening in today have been in that situation where you're waiting to get paid, you did the work, uh, in particular if you're a subcontractor. And I'm not um, trying to knock on general contractors of the, you know, it's just an easy example. You're a subcontractor and the general contractor said, hey, I'm, I'm just waiting for the final payment. It's coming, I'm gonna get you paid. I'm sorry, it's any day now. And it's easy to get lulled into that. And I'm not saying that anyone there is trying to intentionally not pay you, but those that clock is ticking. So it's really important to watch out for that timeline don't get it recorded in that four months, you're going to lose your lien rights. And something else I want to highlight for you, because it's these timing issues are really, really important. So if you I have an example for you, your, your substantial completion is January 11th. Well, you do your four months, February, March, April, May. May 11th is now your lien deadline. And you're like, okay, I'm going to count backwards seven days. And here I am, May 1st, there's my 10 day notice. I've got to send that notice of intent out. Well, great. 
you're looking at this, you send out your notice of intent on May 1st, whoo, I did it, uh, I'm in, I listened to Shannon Bell, I did it 10 days before, I'm good. But I use this example for a reason, because if you follow this example, you did your work on the 11th, your, the May 11th is your lean deadline, you send out your notice on May um, 1st, you have just lost your lien rights because the deadline fell on a Saturday. So if that happens, and it does, the where your deadline from that four months after substantial completion is on a Saturday, a Sunday, or a court holiday, go backwards. Envision that your deadline is now going to be Friday the 10th and everything is going to follow and go backwards from that date. Now, um, the other part of this, I get anxious about deadlines in my world. If you have the possibility, try to avoid waiting till the very last day of that four months. Because as you can see, if there's any issue, you get into a, a weekend, you can have some, some problems there. Talking a few minutes ago about the importance of doing everything correctly, it has to be done uh, by the book. Uh, otherwise, there's there's lots of loopholes. There's lots of ways that you can lose your lien rights. One of the things I see uh, probably most often when companies are trying to do the liens on their own, uh, they're not as familiar with the liens. And I, I don't have it for you in this presentation, but the the full form is either it's a legal size paper. I'm sure most of you have seen one. And you know, you're either going to see the front and the back of the paper, or it's going to be two pages. The first page and four-fifths of the second page or the back page is going to be the information that you fill in as part of that notice. What you do not complete when you're doing that 10-day notice is this affidavit of service at the very end of that second page. This is what you're holding on to after the 10 days has passed then you come back and you execute this affidavit of service. And it's telling you right here, uh, we evidenced it, we served it or mailed it at least 10 days before the filing of that lien statement. Real important, do not complete this affidavit of service when you're mailing that first, the initial notice. Only after that 10 days has passed, only after that 10 days has passed and you still have not gotten paid, now you execute this affidavit of service and then you walk down to your local clerk or recorder or you go online and you record it. The other piece of this, when you're doing the notice, you're completing the paperwork, you're sending it for a certificate, certified mail, hold on to those. You know those little green pieces of paper that they give you at the post office? Uh, you get the stamp on it, you're paying you know, three to four dollars to have it done certified mail. You want to hold on to those, the notice that you are completing and getting ready to mail out, hold on to the original. And after that 10 days pass, when you're uh, filling out this affidavit, you want to be filling out the affidavit on the original and you want to use the original to go record it with the clerk or recorder. Uh, so now that I've terrified you about all the, the deadlines, uh, it's really not the worst. Uh, you just want to pay attention, calendar them. Uh, don't rely on your memory. Just jot some notes down and make sure that you've got reminders. As I mentioned earlier, the other part of it is these are strictly construed. So you're going to want to make sure that you have all of the right information in there. You're going to have to properly identify owners. Uh, that includes the any owner that you're aware of, uh, any general contractors uh, that have performed work on the property. You, you have to properly identify the property. You're really gonna to wanna to put a good legal description. It's not fatal not to have a legal description, but it really is gonna help because the whole idea of the lien is you're trying to properly go in and encumber the real property. And the way the clerk and recorder is going to see that this lien that you're getting ready to record is going to attach. It's gonna show up on the records for the right property is by having a street address and the legal description. If those are missing or they're wrong, 
there's no way for anyone to know what this lien, what piece of property it is attaching to. So you want to get all that information. You also must properly identify the amount that you're owed. If there's some good faith uh, dispute on that, uh, maybe off like a you know hundred dollars or so, that that's probably going to be okay. But if you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show them this is ridiculous. They made me do all this. Uh, there, I did a change order. They didn't want that change order. I know we didn't do it, but that was a hundred thousand dollar change order. Don't add that to your lien. You knowingly overstate that lien you have a risk that you are going to, it's going to get thrown out and now you've lost your protections for the amounts that are genuinely, uh, legitimately owed to you, even if there's some minor dispute about that. I put in your materials just some highlights of these sections I was talking to you about and noting, you know, where you're going to put in the lien claimant. You're going to put them in a lot, uh, but this is owner or reputed owner, uh, that information, go to the real property records anymore. Uh, Zillow is quite frankly a great tool. You can go to Zillow, plug in the street address, and then oftentimes uh, you go to on the right, you'll scroll down and there will be a link to the clerk and recorder's page where you can pull up the owner information, you can pull up the legal description, a lot of information at your fingertips. Uh, this yeah, today's presentation, like I said, we're covering a lot of ground. Uh, these are some of the basics on the liens. There's there's a lot more detail in it, but I really want to just hit the highlights for you. Uh, so what are some of the exceptions? Things to be aware of. You can't lien public land. If you are hired uh, by a municipality, you're hired by, for example, the state of Colorado, you're not going to have a lien right. You're going to have a bond right, but you're not going to have a lien right. And we're going to talk about bonds here in a minute. It's a general laborer, they've got a shortened time. They can only record that lien within two months of their work. Uh, if you do have a contract, beware of that contract. Uh, if there is a waiver of the right to lien in a contract, that's going to be upheld nine times out of 10. But even though I told you in the beginning, have a contract, uh, it's even more important to have a good contract. So look for those type of provisions in any contract. Uh, homeowner's exception. Uh, this is a really powerful tool for homeowners. This is something uh, a general contractor is, is really not going to be applicable, but this is something uh, that can really affect subcontractors and material suppliers in particular, especially if you have maybe a not a great general contractor. What the homeowner's exception says is if the homeowner has paid the contract in full, you cannot lien their land. So homeowner says, I'm building a brand new home. I'm hiring Joe Blow Construction to build my $1 million home. And the homeowner pays Joe Blow Construction a million dollars, but Joe Blow Construction fails to pay its subcontractors. And the subcontractors come in and say, hey, I'm owed $200,000. That's a lot of money. I'm gonna go lien the property. Homeowner says, eh, you don't get to do that. I paid my contract in full to Joe Blow Construction. And uh, that is a valid defense and that is going to bar your lien rights. Uh, notice extending, uh, I, I've been harping on these deadlines, but if you're paying attention, all is not lost. If you're right at the end, it's you're a week before the end of that four months and you realize, oh my gosh, uh, I'm up on the four months. We didn't do the notice. We still haven't been paid. You can do a notice extending your lien rights. That does not have to be shared or mailed to everyone in advance. You can just go record that with the clerk and recorder's office. It's going to buy you an additional four months uh, to get that lien recorded. Really great tool to have in your pocket uh, if, if you're uh, getting close to that, the end of the four months. The other thing I want you to be aware of is the substantial completion. This is that measuring tool, substantial completion. Uh, if the project has been abandoned, it's going to be deemed to be substantial completion three months after abandonment. Now, maybe there'll be some dispute as to when the abandonment occurred, uh, but just be aware of that if you're on a project that's gotten stalled and nothing's happening. So we're, uh, let's move now 
into your bond rights. Now your bonds are going to come up in, these are your governmental projects. If it is in Colorado, a bond is required for state projects in excess of $100,000. Uh, and for local public projects, if it's in excess of $50,000, the governmental entity is going, they're required to get a bond. You can have a payment bond, you can have a performance bond. This is a presentation on getting paid. So here we're looking at your payment bond. It's, I, I think it's really helpful for you uh, to go ahead and get a copy of any bond on a bonded project at the beginning. If you ask for a bond on a bonded project, they have to give it to you, but you don't really wanna wait until the end, until there's a dispute over getting paid. Just try to get a copy of that bond in the beginning. The bond is going to outline the timing and the process for submitting a bond claim. They're very similar to um, what you're, the type of information you're looking for on a lien claim, but again, your deadlines are going to be specified in the bond itself. Uh, you don't have to file any type of notice of intent uh, for a bond claim on a state project, but nevertheless, it's a good idea. Maybe something just got overlooked, and it's an opportunity to see if you can get paid without going through the entire process. And um, if not, you're going to need to file a, a verified notice or statement of claim. Uh, here's just an example of the city and county of Denver, one of their verified statement of claims they use on this old uh, CDOT project. But these are uh, pretty common templates. Something like this is going to work where you're going to just put in the project name, contract number, claim amount, uh, claimant, et cetera. So all of that's gonna be right, right there for you. Uh, another one I wanted to touch base for you is a lot of people are unaware of a disperser notice. Uh, the disperser notice, you, you have to be have the same standing as a lien claimant uh, to do a disperser notice. And what this is going to do though, is it is a vehicle, it's a mechanism for you to go to the party holding the money. And these are most, I think in my experience, a disperser notice has the most impact when you have a lender that is issuing draws to the owner or issuing draws to the general contractor. And what this is going to allow you to do is file this notice of disperser with that entity holding money and say, hey, you're holding funds on this project, but I'm due money on this project. So here's my notice. And if the disperser fails to release those funds to you, they may now become liable for getting you paid and, and getting you made whole. So again, another uh, potentially powerful tool for you to have. Next topic I want to touch upon now is uh, you're exchanging your check for a waiver. Mm -hmm. And this comes up, right? Oh, you want your check? Well, you're going to have to execute this lien waiver. Not uncommon. Uh, and I really don't have an issue with that as long as they're, they're done properly. The four general types of lien waivers that you're going to see is during construction. You've got those progress payments. There is a conditional waiver and release upon progress payment or an unconditional waiver and release upon progress payment. And the same thing for your end of construction final payment. You got your conditional waiver and release or your unconditional waiver and release. Your conditional waiver on a progress payment, that's when you have not yet been paid. And they're coming to you and saying, execute this lien waiver and then we will pay you. That's fine. Uh, Everyone's trying to be protected there because by the way, it is only going to be effective if you actually get that payment. Your unconditional waiver, similar, it's during a progress payment, the construction project is ongoing, but there they're saying, you're acknowledging that you have been paid and you're now doing that lien waiver. So the one is you're going to be paid, the unconditional is you have been paid. So these are on, Progress payments, it's the same concept on final payment. One is, hey, we're getting up on our final draw. We're going to pay you. Uh, you need to execute this lien waiver uh, conditioned upon, that's going to be conditioned uh, upon getting that final payment. 
and then the unconditional waiver is at the final payment again this is you have been paid so the difference between conditional unconditional will be paid has been paid that is uh, i recognize a lot of information uh, to throw at you in, in pretty quick uh, time but this is the goal here is to highlight some various issues that you have or various tools i keep saying tools right it's, 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 it don't mean to be punny here in a con contractor presentation but it's they are these are tools for you to put in your a uh, tool belt to protect you uh, to help you get paid and these are all things to do to try to help you get paid without having to go into the formal legal process any of these fail you always have a backstop of, of filing a lawsuit so with that, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're, we're coming up upon a half hour. I will open it up to any questions. Hi, thanks, Shannon. That was amazing. Um, yes, we do have a question that came through. It says, how long is my lien effective? Assuming ads after they've filed that lien. Uh, great question. Your lien is, your lien is, there's a conflict in the rules. Your lien is effective for 13 months, but you need to foreclose. And when I say foreclose, that means initiating judicial action, initiating a lawsuit. You need to foreclose within six months of when you record that lien. Uh, something else to be aware of is oftentimes if there's a payment problem, there's usually a lot of subcontractors or suppliers that are being affected. If somebody else a watch for that. If someone else initiates a lawsuit, you're going to be able to join in on that lawsuit. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question that came through is, if I don't have a written contract, can I still collect attorney's fees or filing fees um, in a lien? If you do not have a written contract, no, you will not be able to collect your attorney's fees. However, you may be able to uh, uh, collect your filing fees what we have in colorado is that the prevailing party is entitled to their costs if they do not have a contract awarding them legal fees and those costs are going to be uh, photocopies mailing fees filing fees uh, if you have to retain an expert those expert fees are going to be under cost but no you are you lost your ability to collect attorney's fees without a, a written contract giving that to you Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. All right, so that is all the questions that were written in. If anybody does think of a question that wasn't addressed, please feel free to reach out and we will be sure to answer any questions for you. Uh, Shannon, can you go ahead into the next slide for me, please? Thank you. All right, so who is ready to win a gift? We're testing your knowledge. Um, if you guys can answer these questions correctly in the chat, we'll go ahead and send you guys a little a little prize or a little gift. Uh, the first question is, when is the deadline to file a Colorado bond claim? Um, and then the other one is, how long does a contractor have to file a statement of lien in, Col in Colorado? Um, so please go ahead and take a look at those. If you guys can answer in the chat, we'll send you over a gift to you. Um, all right, we can go to the next one, please. Okay, so here are some of Sunray's resources to help you guys out. Make sure that you're staying organized, know your deadlines, and able to secure your lien rights. Um, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. It will take you to these um, resources so you can access them and start utilizing them. You can always reach out to Sunray and we can help you help you along if you need, need that next one please all right so sunray is offering a new service uh, we have sr receivables uh, they will we will handle your collections for you uh, that's new this year uh, we are here to help you guys get paid as always okay um, our next webinar with shannon is tuesday july 9th uh, that's going to be at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So go ahead and register for free at sunraynotice.com forward slash education to get on that list. All right, so if you guys could take a moment to review us on Google, we would really appreciate it. It takes about a minute of your time, but it helps other contractors like yourselves to make sure that they're hearing about us and know these webinars are here um, to assist you and give you guys some of the tools and information you need. 
Uh, can we go to that last slide for me, please? Thank you. And with that, that is all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much to everybody that attended. We hope to see you guys at our next webinar. And Shannon, thank you so much for all of your resources and information that you were able to provide. You are incredible. I hope you guys all have a wonderful and sunny day.